Now it, we're streaming. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for attending this webinar. Uh, it's the fourth uh, dialogue that the CSIS Indonesia held with uh, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung. It's uh, Indonesia and German Germany uh, bilateral dialogue. And in today's webinar, we discuss the technological cooperation in disaster management, the use of technology in handling the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, today, we are very privileged and honored to have with us uh, expert both from Indonesia and Germany um, um, that will be speaking in this uh, session. Uh, the in the speaking order, supposedly the first one that will uh, share the discussion is Dr. Hamam Riza, head of the Agency for the Assessment and Application for Technology, or BPPT. Uh, the second will be Dr. Hario Aswi Cahyono, and the third that is with us is Dr. Florian Roth, project manager of Brian Hauber Institute for System and Innovation Research from IC. Uh, however, uh, because there will be the Dr. Hamam is currently still in a meeting, I think I would like to uh, use my privilege as the moderator for today to uh, adjust the speaking order. But first, we will discuss uh, why is it important to actually talk about technology when we talk about the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. Technological innovation have been designed not only for the purpose of enhancing the quality of life, but also to gaining control over uncertainties of human life. Uh, human study tall buildings capable of resisting earthquakes, or airplanes capable of reading waters and withstanding storm. Indonesia and Germany part in particular had experience in, cooperate, in cooperation uh, in technology innovation to anticipate disaster through the joint project on tsunami, uh, uh, on tsunami early warning system. And with the arrival of COVID pandemic, um, it adds the awareness of utilizing technology to anticipate or mitigate the risk of disaster. Uh, we see technologies used to trace, uh, to do contact tracing, uh, the usage of artificial, artificial intelligence, and data-driven technologies have enabled the response of government to track the infected and to uh, distribute the task kit and health support where, where it needed. We see in the future, technology like AI will be more likely to play a crucial role in human effort to reduce the helplessness amid the disaster and uh, to help produce timely response. Uh, today's panel, uh, we will explore the potential of technology application and perhaps we can actually uh, see where Indonesia and Germany can come together to, to build cooperation in the future. Uh, um, my name is Vitriani. I am a researcher at the International Relation Department of the CSIS Indonesia. And at uh, CSIS Indonesia, we have, of course, altered our working methods uh, through online methods like this to, to build a discussion as a bridge uh, to people, to maintain people and people, people to people interaction. And we also uh, try to still provide our research uh, result in a way that we track the infection rate in Indonesia and provide it to decision maker through our uh, platform. Um, our platform uh, that we built to uh, provide which area in Indonesia that, that are affected heaviest uh, by the COVID pandemic, uh, you can see in our website that uh, it is aspired that that CSI's COVID website will be able to help the government and decision maker to provide a timely response and to check whether their policy is actually provide an impact. And today we're honored and privileged uh, 
to have with us uh, one of the creator of the website, uh, Dr. Haryo Aswi Cahyono. He's a senior researcher at the Department of Economic, the Center for Strategic and International Studies, CSIS Indonesia. And uh, he has been uh, with us for 35 years. So he has been uh, with us through every other disaster. And uh, today he will share with us uh, how the COVID, uh, the, the COVID dashboard of CSIS could provide an illustration of how the COVID spread in Indonesia can be tackled through the use of technology. Uh, and uh, I want to ask Dr. Hario uh, Aswichahyono uh, to give 15 minutes for the presentation on uh, the COVID dashboard of CSIS. Uh, uh, first, uh, I'm not going to discuss the COVID dashboard of CSIS, but uh, the, the, the use of technology in collecting data, in, in uh, getting data, uh, and especially for economics uh, and uh, the trade of- I don't think we can hear you. Oh. Uh, Okay, uh, Dr. Haryo, because your uh, we cannot hear your mic, uh, and and Dr. Hamam is already with us. Maybe while Dr. Haryo fix your mic first, maybe we can uh, we could welcome Dr. Hamam Riza uh, to to take the floor. Um, Dr. Hamam Riza is the head of the agency of the assessment. Hello. Uh, but I, I Hello. Greetings to everybody. <laughs> good afternoon. Good evening. Maybe good morning. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay, Doctor uh, Doctor Hamam, uh, thank you for ending your meeting uh, to join us. I heard you were uh, previously in a very hectic schedule of your meeting, being uh, part of BPPT, the head of agency for the assessment and application of technology, and um, and uh, BPPT is one of the Indonesian agency that leads the technological development in Indonesia. And you spend your life uh, largely in BPPT. And uh, we would like to hear your side of uh, the story on how Indonesia is facing the, the COVID pandemic with the development of technology. Uh, uh, I I give the floor to you. All right, thank you, uh, Fitri. So greetings uh, again to everyone. Uh, it is my honor to be part of this uh, discussion uh, today. That the <clears throat> uh, especially that in the in the this pandemic uh, covid-19 uh, so the center for the strategic and international studies have taken the uh, lead to have a, this virtual uh, webinar so uh, i thank you also to conrad adenur stiftung uh, mr jan which is I see here uh, organizing this uh, meeting. So I would like to share with uh, all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, may I use the share screen? Okay. Let me start this. <clears throat> I have prepared my presentation so that that everybody can really uh, have some thoughts and also uh, inputs uh, on how the Indonesia is, 
is creating the innovation ecosystem, the technological <clears throat> innovation that is really important for handling the COVID-19 outbreak. So first, I would like to, you know, just emphasize that this SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, have affected uh, many peoples, millions of peoples uh, in the world. And I think everyone now probably have a, a common understanding about how little uh, this uh, virus is, okay? So since uh, it, it began in China, uh, late uh, last year, uh, we have seen uh, this pandemic goes globally, yeah, more than 32, 33 million uh, contracted this uh, virus. And especially for Indonesia, uh, we have seen a tremendous increase uh, in the positivity rate, as well as, of course, uh, the uh, recovery rate. And also, we still have uh, really a higher mortality rate uh, compared to uh, the other country. Uh, we need to bring down the positivity rate down to 5% in order for us actually to say that we've, we've achieved uh, uh, flattening the curve of this COVID-19. So in this response, Indonesia, uh, with 34 provinces, hundreds of districts, dozens of villages, or we call this desa, yeah, are supposed to be hand in hand with all the health worker, with the public health center laboratories in order for, for us to combat this pandemic, yeah. And it's not easy to see uh, that COVID-19 uh, is slowing down, uh, yeah. The transmission of COVID-19 in Indonesia is not slowing down. And we need to prepare to basically to prepare all of our people in 34 provinces, 270 million people, basically. Yeah, even though some area, probably you've seen the news that some area, some cities are really clear of this COVID-19, but the mobility, the, <clears throat> the economy, everyone is suffering uh, from uh, the impact of this COVID-19. So at the bottom line, really the, this pandemic impact uh, insists on each nation to basically take care of their health system, healthcare, pharmaceutical products, laboratories products, healthcare supporting products, and certainly <clears throat> a lot of us, many countries are dependent to many other countries, right? And including Indonesia, which sees, which has seen the dependency to its healthcare uh, products, to the pharmaceutical product, to the raw materials of our medicine, even though we have uh, really uh, a traditional her herbal medicines or what we call now is OMAI, is Obat Modern Asli Indonesia, which translated to the original or traditional herbal Indonesian medicine, right? And certainly, <clears throat> A lot of, of this material are, you know, regretfully 
are still being imported from many other countries. So the challenge for us is actually to bring this technological innovation to produce domestic products as import substitutions. And <clears throat> as we all know very well, uh, bringing up uh, some ideas, some uh, research, basic research, early research, preliminary research into, an, uh, uh, let's say, into um, commercialization <clears throat> or into the mass production of this uh, uh, product is not a seamless process. They will, we will see many up and downs actually. A lot of people say about the dead valley of innovation where you risk your technology, you risk your <clears throat> market, you risk uh, the funding that probably should be a major part of bringing a startup product into a scale up production or we call it a commercial season. This, this also include the innovation to for the healthcare product from design, prototyping, validation, registration, you need to follow all the clinical trials, uh, you need to uh, do uh, to have the uh, formal registration process uh, in the Ministry of Health, right, into the permit for production uh, from Ministry of Industry, and to bring this into the market through a commercialization. This is a really a tedious process and a lot of hiccups uh, uh, in if you do this in a normative way. So acceleration of innovation process is really a critical milestone for Indonesia in combating the pandemic COVID-19. Fortunately, <clears throat> BPPT <clears throat> were able with many of our stakeholders from universities, from communities, from uh, the government and industry, as well as acting as an investment and funding of the seed capital can make it happen during this pandemic COVID-19 to bring an innovation ecosystem, which we, we call TF RIC-19 or the Task Force for Research and Innovation, Technological Innovation for COVID-19, which basically in this ecosystem that can do testing, tracing, tracking, treatment, and detection. Technological innovation were, were a tools, I will say, <clears throat> that can help Indonesia to fight, to mitigate the, this pandemic of COVID-19. So we were, this TFRIC organized by BBPT under the Ministry of Research and Technology uh, were able to bring up within the two months period, our local technology to screening process by developing rapid diagnostic test kit, antibody and antigen. We were able to also develop the reverse transcription polymerase chain reaction, or we call this swap test, PCR test, right? We were able to also collect a data set from many of the uh, of the people that were positive for COVID-19, having their X-ray and 
get their CT scan in order for, un, for us to train artificial intelligence application to detect COVID-19 and to uh, provide a complementary diagnostic uh, toward testing of uh, using PCR or uh, screening process. We were able to also develop the mobile laboratory biosafety level two, yeah, which were uh, mandated, yeah, mandated if you want to run a specimen test testing uh, under a certain condition, yeah, and also for treating, we were able to initiate. Uh, the design prototyping up to commercialization by three industry for emergency ventilator, for mobile hand washer, and many other uh, healthcare equipment that is needed in order for us to treat the uh, patient of COVID-19. We were happy that the president himself were at the forefront to use this local technological innovation developed by BBPT with the universities, uh, Gajah Mada University, Erlanga University, and even a small healthcare uh, company in Lombok, Mataram, yeah, were able to bring this product, which we are very proud and we are very happy to get the uh, distribution permit as uh, ruled out by the Ministry of Health. We are, we are actually competing with the imported product for rapid tests because they have the emergency use authorization. Yeah, just like what they have it in the US probably or in Europe. Uh, and we are happy this happens within really uh, a critical time where we need this product uh, as part of our effort yeah, to bring local technologies into uh, fighting the this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. We are also now <clears throat> at, the, at the stage where we are going to uh, launch this uh, second generation of our rapid diagnostic test kit. Uh, based on IgG and IgM with two variants, uh, total antibodies and combo iCOVID-19. This is being developed within the TFRIC that I mentioned earlier uh, with the leading coordinator from Bandung Institute of Technology and also Pajajaran University as well as BBPT and a local, again, a local company that were being uh, transfer this technology to produce uh, this product. <clears throat> we are also at the stage of uh, mass production of our raw material. As I, I mentioned to you, many of these uh, healthcare products basically are a, a finishing uh, a product, whereas the raw material is uh, is still imported uh, from many countries. Now we were able to create domestic raw materials for the rapid diagnostic test kit, especially the recombinant protein and nuclear capsid and S1 with around 90% of purity. Uh, we are also developing biosensor SPR. This is another method actually to do rapid uh, testing because if we want to really fight COVID-19, you really need to focus on testing and tracing and tracking. And we need various kinds of methods to capture the uh, curve in all of other area of Indonesia, not only in the cities, but also in the villages. Yeah, so SPR, is a biomolecule detection technique that is non-destructive, label-free, has high reproducibility, real-time and cheap, actually. Yeah. 
The RT-PCR uh, kit, reverse transcription uh, polymerase chain reaction, was originated uh, by a startup company, yeah, and mass product by our state-owned enterprise in pharmacy, which is PT Biopharma, and we are now being able to deliver the second generation, yeah with a better specificity and sensitivity. Yeah. Where the second generation use a multiplex uh, method. So it will bring a more faster result and increase the capacity of PCR testing, which really Indonesia is lag lagging uh, compared to the other countries. Yeah. Uh, for example, Germany, uh, with the <clears throat> speed of uh, testing, were able to actually mitigate uh, the impact of uh, COVID-19. Uh, so now you Germany have reached the peak, the uh, the peak of the curve, whereas Indonesia is still going up because we are not as aggressive as many other countries in doing testing. So <clears throat> PCR as a gold standard determined by World Health Organization, WHO, we are obligated to actually increase our testing capacity. Not only 40,000 per day, which you can see in the news, but basically you need three or four times more. So we are, we are, we are targeting about 100,000 testing yeah, of specimen with the rate of positivity around 10%, which is really high compared to many other country, which is, you know, WHO suggests that if it is under 5%, probably this COVID-19 is under control, right? And <clears throat> I mentioned about AI. We have collected a uh, data set from various uh, hospital. We use machine learning, deep learning, data mining, and decision support system, which will help the radiologists and doctors to speed up the diagnosis of COVID-19. Uh, we believe this will increase the capacity of testing, not only basically using PCR as the gold standard, but also by having this artificial intelligence for COVID-19 detection, uh, we certainly can have a conclusive uh, result uh, from testing and detecting and certainly in order for us to really map out uh, the whole virus found in Indonesia, the SARS-CoV-2 virus found from in uh, Indonesian, we were able to also do whole genome sequencing. Right now, we are happy to report to you that from TFRIC, uh, the task force were able to submit 14 data sequence genes that have been uploaded to GSAID. This is the biggest number of WGS, whole genome sequencing, committed by uh, a group of research and development. Yeah, of course, there are many other universities. For example, UNER submitted, I think, uh, 12. Uh, and then uh, Aikman, the molecular uh, agency, uh, submitted eight uh, or 10 maybe, yeah. So in total for Indonesia, uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA, yeah, we have submitted uh, around 45 uh, whole genome sequencing. This is very important to actually do you the research for the medicines for COVID-19 as well as for 
uh, vaksin for vaksin. Yeah. And lastly, maybe I share with you the this mobile laboratory based tool which has been deployed to the many hospital. Uh, notably, the first one was uh, arranged in Jakarta, the Army Hospital at Ridwan Meraksa. Uh, last time also we with the minister uh, and the chief of staff of uh, army uh, launched this and were sent to Sumatra, to Medan, North Sumatra for helping distributing the capacity for testing. Uh, and also we've uh, seen uh, some of the uh, state on enterprise uh, procure this best biosafety level two in order for us to help and increase the capacity for specimen testing. At the end, where we need a treatment, ventilator, we're able to uh, run through the all the, the clinical uh, trial and validation tests. And these three type of emergency ventilator are now being distributed to more than 100 uh, hospital, small hospital uh, in the remote areas. And we ask for the parliament members actually to help us to distribute this to each uh, respective uh, area of the parliament uh, members yeah thank you very much for your attention i hope i have shared with you what we have done and probably i look forward uh, to your support and your advice for us uh, for indonesia together with German, Germany to fight this uh, COVID-19 together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hamam Riza. Um, apology for the lag on my side. I think we uh, have fixed the technology on my side and I think this highlight how important the te technology is and how it rules our life. Um, um, it's really important uh, that Dr. Hamam has shared with us the Indonesian government effort to counter uh, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, with all effort in technology, developing technology, um, in testing, tracking, detection, and then treating, and uh, able to provide it in a fast and affordable manner. And uh, I think it is important uh, after we see from the government perspective, we now can continue with Dr. Hario, as we chat, you know, uh, Hario, apology for before, uh, it's okay. a technology like on my side. And uh, as I have been brief, uh, Dr. Hario will share with us more in general uh, about the use of technology in uh, fighting for the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Dr. Hario Asuchahyono, the screen is yours. Okay, let me share my screen first. Can you see it? Not yet then. Is it shared already? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you just need to slideshow. The... Oh, you can no, I, I, I use it. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, uh, we have talked much about the COVID side, uh, the pandemic side of the 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 discussion is on uh, pandemic side. Uh, I would like to present on the economic side. Yeah. Uh, the use of technology in real time, high frequency data collection for monitoring economic activity. You know, because uh, there is supposed a trade off between economic activities and COVID pandemic. Because uh, if you are locked down, 
then you cannot work. Then it affect economic activity. Uh, and as you know, the tracking of economy uh, of pandemic is daily, but the data for economic is quarterly, uh, yearly. Uh, most most high frequency is monthly. So we need a, a better monitoring for economic activity uh, using real-time high frequency data collection uh, for monitoring economic activity. Uh, why is it important? Because uh, very few, like I mentioned before, very few high frequency economic indicators. And uh, in addition, there are not they are not indicators that directly measures the output of economic activities, but a proxy for economic activities. Uh, uh, moreover, most of these proxy indicators are national and sectoral aggregate with very few proxy indicators to measure regional economic activity. So with the help of technology, we can have, hopefully we can collect real time indicators uh, and this presentation is an attempt to survey those indicators. Uh, there are two parts, national and regional economic indicators and sectoral economic indicators, uh, which is high frequency. First, uh, national and regional economic activity. Uh, we have a Facebook range map, yeah, measuring the movement of people between two places in a certain period, yeah, and uh, they present, uh, they uh, update the data with two to three days lag. It's quite, quite recent, yeah, quite, quite good. And the level is very detailed, district. As you know, Indonesia have 500 districts. So uh, they are a very, uh, uh, quite big data for this, yeah? And uh, the variables is percent of F Facebook users that are not moved, mean staying put, yeah? Stay at home. And the percent of change of FB users moving compared to baseline. Uh, I give you the U URL, URL for URL for, for download, uh, that's in HAM data. Whom data. Uh, next is a Google Mobility Index, similar to Facebook, but uh, it updated once a week, yeah, with two to three days lag. Uh, the level is not district. Uh, this uh, province, province. The level is province. Uh, and the variable uh, is Google users who travel compared to the baseline uh, were differentiated by destination location. So parks, retail, recreation areas, transportation, uh, transit centers, workplace, and uh, residential, residential movement. Residential movements is similar to stay put in the Facebook uh, range map. Uh, Another indicators that can be used to, to, to measure economic activity is pollution. Yeah? Pollution in a city, uh, because the more economic activity uh, we can expect, uh, more pollution. Uh, for example, in Jakarta, you can see there, is, there was a drop in December. It is before COVID. What's happened? Uh, it is a flood in Jakarta, a very severe flood in Jakarta. So that there is no movement of people during that time, uh, very little movement of people during that time. So it, it's already dropped before the COVID. And you can track the increase in the movement of uh, the pollution, which indicate increase in economic activity. I present only Jakarta. Actually, we have uh, all provinces in Indonesia for this pollution data. Yeah, and this is uh, land based, not satellite based. Yeah, uh, we can dis we, we will discuss later on the the satellite based uh, 
pollution data. Next is nightlife. Yeah, uh, this is also proxy of economic activity. The more economic activity, the the more light will be emitted uh, in certain area. Yeah, especially in the city for services sectors. Yeah, uh, this indicate the the economic activity in uh, urban area. Yeah. <coughs> Uh, it's already conducted by a think tank, Prospera, using data from NASA. Yeah. So you can see the map, it shows the economic activity. Java is very high economic activity, uh, not very yeah, high economic activity compared to other islands. Next is uh, sectoral activity. Uh, we can trace some sectoral ac activities, not all, not 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 many yeah but some important uh, sector like airline arrival and departure yeah you know you you can uh, look at web website yeah uh, and find this arrival and departures uh, schedule so you can see this oh yeah before i would like to go back to the facebook range map you see the economic activity decline since August. Yeah. So we can expect the third quarter economic growth will be not higher than, than quarter one, similar to Google map. Now we have a support also in the airline arrival and departures. It's also declined since September. Also ship arrival and departure at port yeah, this is cargo departure port from eight major ports in Indonesia. You can see also since uh, September is also declined. Yeah. Uh, next, e-commerce. Yeah. E-commerce uh, also we can find it in a web. Yeah, uh, we have a monthly data, not daily data. But if you subscribe to the to the to the web to this web, then you can have daily data. So this is a traffic overview of the uh, total visits, for example, divided by web and apps. Yeah, uh, This the example is for two major e-commerce in Indonesia, uh, which is Tokopedia and Shopee. Yeah? You see Shopee is higher than Tokopedia. Yeah? So this time is fighting for the market share also. <laughs> now next is, uh, this is based on the, uh, the satellite image and NO2 pollution. Yeah. This is especially pollution for manufacturing activities. So this, this method, uh, it's useful to measure uh, manufacturing activity. Yeah, uh, Thailand already use it effectively, uh, together with the light, the light, uh, the light emission uh, from satellite, and uh, Mr. Ministry of Finance uh, and Fiscal Policy Planning Agency uh, uh, already use this to estimate the economy. Oh, by the way, the first quarter of GDP in Indonesia is the estimate for first quarter of Indonesian GDP is overestimated, highly overestimated. So it is important to have this high frequency data uh, to make a more uh, accurate prediction of economic activity, now casting. Uh, and how we analyze this data, you know, uh, we have high frequency data, proxy high frequency data, but traditionally we have also a monthly or quarterly data. So we need to combine those data uh, using uh, MIDAS, mixed data sampling. So basically we mix the, the high frequency data from the web, uh, from Google map, uh, from Google uh, mobility index from Facebook mobility index. We combine it with uh, quarterly data uh, 
uh, for GDP, and then we uh, estimate our, our now casting uh, the economic activity. Yeah. As CSIS, CSIS also uh, use uh, Facebook range map together with COVID data to, uh, to estimate the severity of economic downturn and the severity of pandemic. So we have four scenario, the economic is improving uh, and COVID is flattening, the economy is improving, COVID is increasing, the economy is worsening and COVID is increasing and the economy is worsening and uh, COVID is flattening. So what's the effectiveness of the, what is the trade off? How effective the government in managing uh, these two crisis, health crisis and economic crisis. So we have, we can, you can click this covid19.csis.org.id. We present daily uh, with lack of two to three days, uh, uh, the, the horizontal axis to the right is indicate an increase in movement. So increase in movement uh, is a proxy for increase in economic activities to the life show decrease in activity on the vertical axis uh, to the top indicates improvement uh, in COVID. Uh, go down is uh, show deterioration yeah uh, you see most there are very few uh, province that improve in economic as well as COVID. Most of province in this area, meaning uh, improve economic, some improvement in economic activity, uh, but uh, declining uh, COVID-19. And you can see there are also few provinces, yeah, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven provinces, uh, that is deteriorating in both in economic activity as well as uh, COVID. So we need uh, we need to do more to improve the situation to move this dot to the top to the right. Yeah. So what's the suggestion? It's only uh, first attempt to collect this data. Uh, from the CSIS set. Uh, so we need more. Yeah. So we need capacity building and training also with the government. Uh, for, for example, coding, yeah. uh, management of data, yeah. uh, how data from different ministry should be collected. It's, uh, it's difficult. That's, that's the problem. Yeah. Uh, many ministries uh, you uh, want to keep the data for themselves sometime, yeah? Uh, and then, so we need capacity building and training. Yeah? Government already have uh, planning, plan for one data, yeah? But uh, I don't know uh, what's the progress, yeah? Uh, this is uh, the first suggestion. Second is research collaboration, yeah? Especially for for uh, not uh, for think tanks that don't have a financial capacity or uh, new knowledge on, for example, start satellite imagery, yeah, analyzing satellite imagery. Uh, so we need research collaboration. Yeah, uh, we need we know what we want to know, but we don't have the capacity and the technology and the, and the funding uh, to analyze uh, uh, high frequency data uh, as I already mentioned the funding and access access to data uh, I think that's all uh, thank you thank you dr Haryo Arswijahyono for your presentation uh, I think it's very important to 
uh, discuss the situation of economic activity in the time of COVID pandemic, because I think for countries, um, especially uh, from the webinar yesterday, we, did, we have discussed how we can build back the economy uh, after the COVID pandemic. And uh, some countries sometimes struggle, economic first or health first. And with your presentation, Dr. As, uh, Aswi Chahirono, we, we learned that with uh, true um, uh, real-time high-frequency data, probably we can win both um, economy and health. Uh, now we'll turn to Dr. Florian Roth. Uh, he is a project manager at Fraunhofer Institute for System and Innovation Research at IC. Uh, he's very patient with me, uh, and uh, he he because he will be the only person that will explain from the German side. Uh, he would have this great burden of explaining how Germany has been so um, successful in handling the COVID pandemic uh, using technology, and then. Um, perhaps currently uh, enable the country to rebuild its economy. Uh, I provide the screen for you, Dr. Roth. Uh, time is yours. Thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Could you please confirm? Works? OK, perfect. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, Selamat Pagi. Namasaya Florian, Florian Roth, uh, Fraunhofer EC. Um, it's the Institute for Systemic and Innovation Research in Karlsruhe, Germany. I'm very glad uh, to be with you today, uh, only virtually, unfortunately, but nonetheless, very happy to have been invited to this uh, webinar and to talk a little bit about um, COVID-19, but also like resilience more generally, because I think that's very important to use this uh, like really key moment in, in uh, like public health care, but also like disaster risk prevention more generally to, to really now um, take the right decisions and, and build resilience and, and, and not only to focus too much on crisis management. I know that's obviously at the moment the, the main thing. And then I think the previous presentation showed that that uh, a lot is going on there, but uh, my my presentation will take a bit of a broader look on uh, like how we can use uh, this situation also as an opportunity to for more long term sustainable solutions for building resilient systems. Um, very briefly. Just what I will talk about, like in the next like ten to twelve minutes, uh, I will briefly introduce the Fraunhofer Institute I work for in Karlsruhe, and then uh, go a bit into the conceptual background of like uh, what is actually resilience and and why do we aim not only for bouncing back now to come back to to normal state, but use this. Uh, use this crisis to bounce forward to build a better better uh, systems and, and 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 ultimately like global governance mechanisms that support resilience i will very briefly only use some examples from artificial intelligence research and, and research we've been doing on um, on how like we can use digital technologies in this context but in the end, I will also show that uh, building social technical resilience, which is which is my understanding of, of of the challenge at hand, is much more than just like uh, developing and employing digital technologies. We need like a comprehensive strategy for that. So this on the right, you can see a uh, beautiful city of Karlsruhe, um, where my institute is based, somewhere in the forest in the back, um, whoever uh, is passing by uh, Germany, very warmly invited to Karlsruhe, uh, nice city. Uh, Fraunhofer EC, our Institute for System and Innovation Research is like one of 72 institutes within the Fraunhofer family, like the Fraunhofer Society which is with over 28,000 employees, the largest organization 
for applied research in Europe, uh, a lot of technical expertise spread out over whole Germany, like developing uh, innovative solutions for all kinds of challenges. In, and then I think like most of these institutes currently are working on technical, um, on, on new technologies to, to fight uh, the current pandemic. Um, this is the institute, um, and the, this institute is kind of special within the within the uh, Fraunhofer family because it has technological expertise, but it brings it together with economic and social science knowledge, and really to to have like interdisciplinary innovation research from a systemic perspective to conduct analyses to do evaluations. Uh, and also to uh, to predict and forecast uh, future developments, whether it's ecological or social. And this really, I, I started there last year, and it's I must say it's really exciting to work with all the colleagues there. Before that, I was working for the last nine years at ETH Zurich in Switzerland, a large federal university. They the risk and resilience team together with. Um, uh, with federal uh, authorities in Switzerland mainly, but also in Germany and, and on the European level, and also in support of global disaster risk reduction uh, processes. I will talk about that a little bit also about like my, my work in this context. And I hope this is um, interesting to you and, 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 and gets a discussion going. So, what, what we really try to do, like in most of these projects, is really bring in a systemic perspective on innovation, but also like on adaptation and transformation processes, which I think like is really the key there that we that we look at systems that um, after the after the COVID-19 pandemic should be restored uh, to the to the previous uh, nature, but other systems, if you think of like the large challenges of our time, like decarbonization, climate change, digitalization. We really have to transform many of our systems, like the mobility sector, like our education systems and so on. And I think like we we um, we should use this chance to get this transformation process going. Okay, very briefly on the concept of resilience. Uh, I think like what most people associated associated with the concept of resilience is like this idea that you have like an individual or a, a structure or a system and this system experiences a shock event a disturbance um and 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 it's somehow thrown off balance and it tries to to stand up again get back on the feet and regain functionality and you can see like the this like very generic functionality curve at the lower part of the slide uh, where you where you have the shock event you lose functionality and you try to to recover and restore your system as fast as possible i think it's pretty straightforward if you think of like a basic structure like a electricity grid or or a water supply system or so this system it's like planned in a certain fashion uh it's, it has uh a desired performance uh levels and and due to a shock or disturbance functionality breaks down and you want to restore that so the si system does what it's supposed to do um, and um resilience can can help to to understand like the robustness the redundancy of this system However, um, I'm personally favoring uh, a broader perspective on resilience. Uh, we call it transformative resilience, and it's, it has been developed in ecological studies uh, like already 30 years ago, but now over the last like 20 years, it has been also applied to organizational studies, to psychology, like how individuals deal with with traumata and also how whole like social and social technical systems deal with with uh, disturbances and the fascinating thing about it is that you that you don't uh, only like aim for recovery but you what what uh, it's a bit small and 
please excuse, excuse that. It's called the betterment that you actually like that you're doing better, that you're improving after disturbance. And I think that really uh, makes a makes a huge difference. So in this sense, we can define resilience as the ability of an individual, a group, or a system to withstand and absorb shocks. That's also like part of the engineering resilience approach, but also to learn from disturbances, adapt, and if necessary, to transform in order to survive. And I think that's that's very like what I was talking about earlier, uh, like the the that we now start learning like our what institutional learning I'm talking about about our experiences to 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 develop institutional learning processes so that we are not only ready for the next pandemic that's that's one step but that we also are able to to adapt and to prepare for a broad range of risks that are out there that we have generic like adaptive capacities and and uh of course like this raises the question like what what uh capabilities what characteristics tell us if our systems if our whole nation or our international structures if they are resilient or not and research has uh, found like some consistent attributes like robustness obviously uh, that's that's straightforward you need like a, a certain level of of robustness in uh, that you're not like tipped off balance so easily and and you need redundancies uh so you're not too much fixed on a single like uh model business model so to speak so in in an ecosystem if if you if 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 you have a monoculture uh you you're kind of vulnerable towards outside stresses if you think of like a coral reef or uh, that you can see on the right or, or mangrove forest these are very complex ecosystems with a lot of a high number of species and we can learn a lot about like how these systems like develop redundancies and and how they how they are organized with uh, according to the principles of emergence and and self-organization and they're very rapid in 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 dealing with only weak signals uh developing adaptation strategies uh or responses to to outside shocks and 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 this way like adapting to outside uh influences and what what i find particularly interesting and this relates to some of the of the uh previous uh presentations of of uh that that you want like that resilience requires modularity which means like you you hyper connected systems which which are kind of uh typical for our globalized world today it means that everything is connected to everything and this can create vulnerabilities in terms of like for example cascading effects and so on so if 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 you if you overly rely on on others uh it's this can create vulnerabilities. However, you also don't want to like deconnect um, because uh, a system that's decoupled it's very inefficient in in many ways and it's it's not able to absorb shocks well and it's uh, not not able to to adapt to disturbances. So you want like a certain level of interconnectedness and 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 you want subsystems be able to work on their own without too much de dependencies but at the same time you need the dependencies so you really constantly have to find the right um, right level of connectedness and i think that's really like one of the big challenges now in the resilience debate and in COVID 19 that uh, if you follow academic discussions and the media political debates it's often about like resilience being like understood like okay now we have to do everything ourselves and we have to be fully like independent and which is in the first place i think in a globalized world it's 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 rather unrealistic and i think it's not desirable it's very inefficient and and we would like lose ma many of the benefits of globalization that we that we've won over the last years so 
Um, but still we have to think about, okay, how can we continue working? Let's say like if, if, if a critical dependency is, um, is, is causing problems, how can we find workarounds? How can we develop uh, uh, flexible solutions? And, and, and a key attribute in this context is, is the principle of diversity. If you think of the coral reef, again, you need like a lot of species and sometimes you don't even know what these species are good for in your ecosystem. And nonetheless, when there's a stress, you, you realize that, uh, that the diversity of the system is essential. And, and uh, often we, we don't even understand the complexity and the, the functioning of these uh, complex adaptive systems. And um, this is connected to the question of resourcefulness. Uh, Resilient systems, they don't centralize too much of, of the resources, the capabilities and the know, and the know how, but they, they have it distributed to, to self organizing sub uh, elements that, uh, that hold the capacities to, to response. And you can think about like now, like uh, COVID-19 or, or other uh, risks, how how you can strengthen the resources within your system so that that all the elements let's say like subnational local actors that they have the resources to to respond in a very generic way and this is like not not very specific technical expertise but it's more about like generic um capabilities that are that are uh useful in 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 very different uh, hazard scenarios. Last two points are uh, self-organization. I mentioned that already and experimentation. I think this is important that we that we don't, uh, in resilient systems, there's not a single steering authority that can, that know, has all the information to, to tell like, this is the right way to go, but we have to, explore and experiment constantly and figure out like which which uh solution is the best which which one works out and because no one has all the information necessary to decide that we 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 have to have some also competition in the system and experiment coming to uh the role of digital technologies in building this resilience probably what you're most interested in uh, is like, um, I will just focus on artificial intelligence as one of the big buzzwords. Uh, most people actually mean machine learning when they talk about artificial intelligence. I mean, there are many other technologies out there that, uh, uh, that, that would be worth uh, spending a whole morning, but just like, because time is limited, I will focus on AI. As you all know, like this artificial intelligence has really grown fast in its, its capabilities over the last five to 10 years, uh, driven by cheap computing power, large data sets, and, and last but not least, uh, deep learning algorithms. And it's, it's already today you can find uh, machine learning uh, applications at all at all levels in uh, disaster management in crisis management and uh, it's really like what what maybe call like uh, omnifunctional technology that it's so it's so present it's so powerful that that you can hardly find a, a subfield of uh, disaster management that is not somehow related or can't profit from artificial intelligence um, just to give a few examples, it's like uh, we've looked at protecting infrastructures, how you can, uh, they're already today like pilots on predicting local failures of um, infrastructures like electricity grids or um, gas supply grids uh, and how you, for example, like AI can support uh, inspection authorities to determine which buildings they have to inspect uh, in, in terms of like of earthquake um, prevention. And um, these approaches are very promising. Um, it's, it's, not, it's nothing very easy to do because like typically the, the data you need to, to run those 
um, to run those analyzers, they are held in data silos by very different authorities. You have to really integrate them. You are also like within, like uh, b between like national authorities, but in particular on a global level, that's I think really one of the main challenges in in bringing AI to application in this field is like creating really uh, <coughs> global databases because like we're talking here about like extreme events that are uh, that are very rare. So and it's it's kind of hard to train AI algorithms to to help us to deal with rare extreme events. But if we but if we have if we have the right data set, we can use it for example to uh, to improve risk analysis and early warning uh, uh, mechanisms. It's already, for example, in California, uh, I know projects that work uh, with with AI to model uh, wildfires and in real time how wildfires develop. And, uh, and this very useful information, obviously, for for the people on the ground and uh, also like in um swiss authorities are uh, that we're working with use ai for identifying pathogens which is uh obviously like a very timely timely field last but not least we can ai use to monitor for example detect suspicious patterns in cyberspace but also like in real world uh, we can monitor social media we can monitor physical distance and um, what what the previous presenters also talked about, like to 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 uh, discover symptoms of um, of infectious diseases, for example. So there there's a very broad range of AI of AI applications. Uh, at the same time, we and on the right you can see two studies by colleagues of mine and myself, like on on the role of digital technologies. Um, one is unfortunately only in German, the other is in English available with my, with my old colleagues in Zurich. But what we find there, it's like that, that digital technologies are very useful, but they are no silver bullet. You have to be, and this particularly because uh, the, uh, the field of disaster management is a kind of particular that you, that you have like a strong criteria of robustness and security. So, let's say, like, if you if you if you take the example of the uh, wildfire uh, modeling, it's something else. It's it's a difference between modeling a business case and modeling a wildfire. Because if you model a wildfire in a wrong way, you might have like a, a group of fire fighters being killed in, in in during a deployment. So it's really like about life and death, and we have to be aware and much of the information we are dealing with, it's very sensitive. And it also has often like a, a ethical component. Uh, we, we have to ensure that AI applications are, are uh, like uh, meet high ethical standards are fair in a social and, and uh, political way. And we have to uh, predefine uh, the criteria there. And last but not least, the data has to be uh, interpretable in a, in a by experts so it's not often the data as such doesn't tell you right away or it even shouldn't tell you right away what to do but if you need the humans that are able to analyze and interpret this data coming already to my last slide um, i think what's what's uh, is that Resilience of technical systems, and I think that's an important point uh, of technical systems. We can pose that if you think of a building, you can you, you can develop building codes, and and you can enforce these buildings codes. And if 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 uh, people who are building uh, these buildings, um, if they follow them, you can increase the resilience of these structures. For example, in the face of floodings or earthquakes. But the same is not really, you can't do the same really with, with socio-technical systems where, where you have people involved, you have human behavior. The best IT security system will not help you if people uh, uh, find it too 
to yeah, annoying uh, to to follow security measures and and find workarounds. So, and or if you if you develop the best like prevention measures for uh, for in avoiding a COVID nineteen infection, but people don't see the risk, they 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 ignore it. So it's really a lot about like. Uh, risk awareness and and risk education and and getting that process uh, uh, rolling very at a very early stage and this is something that really reaches beyond the actual crisis. I think we really see now in real time that that uh, how the how the involvement of of the whole population and civil society actors and so is really a key resource of the overall system to be resilient. And we have to invest in that. We have to invest in risk awareness. We have to invest in risk education and we have to empower um, these social actors. And in doing so, we have to reduce the vulnerabilities, the technical vulnerabilities of our systems, but also the social vulnerabilities. Just give an example that's like from a study we did in the city of Zurich of social vulnerability in the face of floodings, but we did the same for power blackouts. We did the same for pandemics, for very different kinds of scenarios, trying to figure out which are the groups that, that need support. And we use GIS analysis, expert interviews, and, and, and big data analysis to identify clusters where, where, for example, elderly people are living alone, where, where there are low income families, and, and, and then to provide um, useful information to the authorities and to NGOs to develop really targeted strategies for these vulnerable groups. And I think like that's, if you wanna like have overall socio-technical resilience, that's, um, that's something you always have to keep in mind. Last point, uh, I think like building resilience really also needs like new modes of governance. We, as I mentioned before, we really have to empower uh, societal actors, whether it's the private sector, uh, small startups that are very agile, flexible in developing uh, in developing solutions for for the problems of our time, and also civil society like social innovation, um, citizen science projects, and all that. And I think like we we should really invest in that. And last but not least, we, we should strengthen international cooperation and, and multilateral cooperation and in institutions. For example, like I did some research on the Center Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction and the monitoring and reporting process that is part of, the, uh, of this process. I'm sure you're aware of that. And I think there you, um, we really have to, to um, strengthen the um the data component of that uh the 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 countries that uh, are part of this framework they are um required to report data on losses on on also their capabilities in dealing with natural hazards but also pandemics and but there's a lot of uh, data still missing uh, member states are are uh, really under reporting there and that we need a much better database. We need much closer cooperation between the actors involved. And, and I think like it's really a, a, a important international framework that can help in a, in a diverse set of, of risk scenarios. And we, I think we should really um, use current COVID-19 uh, pandemic as, as like a reminder that, that, that this international cooperation uh, is, is essential in the globalized world and it profits all of us it, 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 uh, uh, because there are no, 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 no political islands in a globalized world. We are so deeply connected that we, that we need this international cooperation. So I thank you very much for your attention and I'm looking very forward to, to the discussions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Florian Roth. Thank you for the three speakers, Dr. Hamam Riza, Dr. Aharyo Arsti Cahyono, and Dr. Florian Roth. I was just informed that Dr. Hamam Riza has 
a government official in a country that's really fighting for COVID pandemic in the height of it. Uh, he informed that he only have 10 minutes with us. And because of that, I would like to ask um, for your time, Dr. Hamam, to answer several questions that is directed to you. The first one being uh, given by uh, other panelists, Dr. Hario as well, that ask about uh, how to collect data from different ministries. And we know in Indonesia, we have every ministry collect different uh, data and, and sometimes we don't know how to align or collect and align. Um, that's the first. The second is uh, regarding the artificial intelligence in Indonesia. Uh, what sort of innovation has there been in the sector? And uh, how is it used in this pandemic management? Um, and if you can, uh, and there's this several questions, and uh, do you have uh, any uh, countries that uh, you, you can refer to that Indonesia uh, would like learn best practice from? Uh, and uh, does Indonesia have a discussion about ethics of the use of artificial intelligence as previously uh, discussed by Dr. Roth, how artificial intelligence can, can Although it's uh, have its benefit, it also uh, carries a certain risk. So, Dr. Hamam, with your uh, limited time, uh, the screen is yours. Oh, okay, okay. Oh, unfortunately, he's just left. Oh well, uh, I guess. Uh, because of this really uh, crucial time in Indonesia COVID response. Uh, I know it would not be fair for Dr. Hario to uh, take up the space, the space to represent Indonesia, but to the limited of your knowledge, Dr. Hario, uh, the Indonesian government are really being questioned uh, in terms of how it has uh, applied data as well as artificial intelligence. If you uh, know how this technology specifically has been used in Indonesia, uh, would you care to enlighten us? And there is one question that is directed to you, uh, uh, Dr. Hario. Uh, with the rate of our technological in innovation uh, that you were mentioning, really depended heavily on the availability of data. Does this mean that Indonesia should prioritize to build a form of connectivity uh, to track and archive uh, the aspect of uh, our society and economic life uh, so that we can actually uh, you know, address this, this situation of uh, COVID-19 and, and uh, with more indicators, we can, uh, you know, successfully get through this pandemic. Uh, you can write that question down first. I know it's really difficult. And uh, there's question to Dr. Florian Roth uh, after this. Uh, Dr. Florian Roth, there is a question uh, with the artificial intelligence as the catchphrase. And, and there has been discussion about the, the ethics, of course, and we want to know uh, how is in Germany, you, you, uh, your country are actually dealing with this. Do you have any um, uh, strategy, national strategy on implementing uh, new technology? And I know I heard in the news that, uh, for example, the issue of Facebook has been really contested because it's collect data and, and and uh, you know, uh, you you mentioned about uh, the role of um, the interpret. This is for me interpretab interpretability of the data by expert. And and in 2014, we have this uh, very like notable book called the Tyranny of Expert, on on how the, the expert can be you know can be also a barrier. And how how do you you see this forward? So two questions for Dr. Ross. But now I will give the floor to Dr. Hario Aswicahyo to say the, the, the first question. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. A very good question. Uh, and I agree that we need more connectivity and penetration. Of course, that's uh, in important factors uh, for uh, evidence, uh, database uh, policy making. 
Uh, so what we need for that is data infrastructures. Yeah. More data in, 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 in infrastructures, uh, bandwidth, bandwidth for all area of Indonesia. Uh, so we have to uh, deal with digital divide. Yeah. So that's, that's one thing. Uh, for example, in Eastern Indonesia, it's less reliable the data, uh, the, the bandwidth, the internet. Yeah? Uh, and secondly, some hardware is also very important. Yeah? Sensors, many, many time of many type of sensors. We need uh, uh, more of that, for example, pollution sensors, yeah? so that we can monitor uh, economic activity as well as pollution, as well as uh, yeah, for for green economy, we need more monitors. So that infrastructure that we need. Uh, but uh, but some we don't need new investment. For example, we can use the satellite that already available, uh, provided by NASA, by EU. Yeah. So that that's one thing that uh, that help. Yeah. Uh, but we need more detail. So that that why we still need sensor, land-based sensor. Yeah. Uh, but we also need skill, skill in collecting data, skill in organizing data. It's not easy, especially dealing with bureaucrat yeah. who provide data also. Yeah. Analyzing data, including AI, a more uh, realistic AI. Yeah. Uh, Designed for developing country, and finally, because uh, internet literacy, technological literacy is is slow in Indonesia, we need a design of user friendly interface uh, between technology and people. That's 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 more important uh, in developing country in which uh, digital literacy is low. And of course, the last part is government, the role of government. Not so much of regulation. Yes, regulation is important, but more importantly is facilitation. Yeah? Uh, security, in terms of security, data security, uh, in terms of consumer protection yeah? from fraud. Yeah? For, uh, there are many fraud in financial apps now in Indonesia. Every month, government announce uh, several apps, uh, fi uh, financial apps, that is uh, fraud. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that are uh, my answers. I, I, in regard to the uh, coordination between ministry, uh, it's, it's the most difficult aspect of data, I think, in Indonesia. Yeah. That's the silo mentality. Yeah, uh, my data is my data. I I I won't share it because information is power. Data is power. So, fortunately, we have alternative data provided by private sectors. Yeah, for example, flight. Uh, Department Perhubungan, the Ministry of Transportation, only publish flight statistics monthly. But we can access daily data from private company. Inflation, we have data from e-commerce so that government cannot lie with the statistic because we have alternative uh, data to cross-check the data from government. So that's the, the power of information, yeah? uh, decentralized information. I think that's my answer. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hari Raswichahirno. Uh, well, I think because of your sharp point about the, the there is a challenge of uh, coordination between ministries, kind of pressurizing the representative of the ministry that's uh, attending the panel, not that I say. But I said, um, um, I think, uh, yeah, I agree with you. Fortunately, we have alternative data provided from the private sector, but I guess that will uh, connect with 
uh, our subsequent question that I will raise for you, you, know, you both, uh, about the challenge of this private uh, yes. provider of data. But we, we will discuss that later. Uh, now I will give the screen to <coughs> Dr. Rod to, to answer the issue of uh, like at, at, ethics in uh, um, artificial intelligence and whether the, the go German government has specific uh, national guidelines and national strategy to implement uh, new technology. Uh, I think, Thank you very much for the question. Uh, yes, this is very like, I think it's very important and we have to take it serious. And I think COVID-19 already shows that, yeah, in many countries, governmental and private actors are using uh, this opportunity or are using this moment uh, of, of the pandemic that there's a high pressure on finding solutions that they, that, uh, that's been used in a in a really problematic sense. That uh, that we that new technologies, uh, whether it's surveillance technologies or um, uh, so, uh, social media monitoring and so on, in a in a fashion that it's uh, that raises uh, important ethical questions. And uh, I think the same applies to artificial intelligence, which. Uh, I think one of the questions was uh, in, in, that I saw in the Q and A is like, uh, yeah, uh, most of these applications are still in the pilot stage. Yes, and I think like uh, there's there's really like the gap between developing a pilot that looks nice in a demonstrator and having something that that works on a large scale is 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 always hard, but it's particularly hard in the in the context as I mentioned, disaster management or fighting a pandemic when. When the when the room for making mistakes uh, is is very small and and you have to have really reliable systems, I think that's a special case. But still, I think like we can already see we can see the way in which like artificial intelligence is 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 entering our everyday lives and and is entering our modes of disaster management. And I think like now it's high time to to develop like certain like mechanisms to to control um, to control the use in a in a democratic uh, fashion, and I think like um, Germany is um, you're right. It's very active in the, uh, when it comes to data privacy, for example. But <clears throat> um, I think like German authorities, they are. They are making an effort um, to to develop some standards, but it's, I think there's also a realistic understanding that as an as a nation, and even if it's like the largest economy within Europe, your hands are literally tied to to have a, a bearing on, uh, in particularly on global companies like uh, the big five tech companies or so that that you have to find at least regional agreements, regulations, and uh, uh, and uh, Germany is, is very active on the European level in in in, um, in developing standards and um, and 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 certain criteria. And I think like what's key there is that that many different stakeholders are involved and and that we bring in science we bring in policy makers but also like social stakeholders that are that don't necessarily have a technical background but but uh, look at these questions from other perspectives and uh, i think there are there are great initiatives out there just to mention ai for good uh, which is i think a very interesting initiative to uh, to apply artificial intelligence in a responsible way, to have responsible uh, research there and responsible applications. And I think that's something we can really build on. And I think this connects to the to the second question, like how can we how can we interpret this data? How can how can we ensure that uh, that the algorithms are not deciding for us, but they help us actually in our, our 
um, in our own decisions and, and ultimately political common decisions should remain in the hands of, of, of humans. And, and I think that's a constant challenge because we often see uh, this problem with, with decision support uh, systems that, that they somehow take over. They, say they are designed only to suggest uh, certain alternatives, that, but in the end, they, 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 they nudge you or, or, or lead you towards uh, a specific uh, pathway. And I think like the, the, the best we can do is like uh, really uh, we need scientists, but also policymakers with with a very basic understanding of of the possibilities but also of the limits of machine learning artificial intelligence that uh you need like a basic statistical knowledge um and then we really have to get that into our education systems to and i think like germany is uh, still has to learn a lot there i think it's not it's not globally in a leading position there when it comes to to the to the know-how also like of young policymakers in 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 um, understanding what is actually how what if if an artificial intelligence algorithm tells you we found a correlation here or there what it actually means how how to how to make sense of that and and I think like that's something we um, the only thing that helps is to to engage with it. I think we can't really stay away from these technologies. It doesn't it also doesn't make sense, and and it's uh, it's uh, it's so powerful. And if you look at our global challenges, I think like it would it would be really counterproductive uh, to to say like okay, uh, given the risks involved in in in, uh, in using machine learning. To deal with these challenges, we uh, we completely try to stay away from it. I think we are able, uh, if we if if and particularly on a on a global level, uh, if um, and and I mean like we have the, the institutions, they are out there. We just have to use them to to develop standards and and best practices to use these new technologies in a in an ethical uh, and fair fair way. Thank you, Dr. Roth. Um, uh, because our limited time, and I would like to later on, before the time is up, to provide time for uh, Mr. Jan Senkir and Dr. Philip Sermonte to uh, say a couple of words of the um, comments and conclusion of our Indonesia and Germany dialogue. So, if I may ask you a uh, last question, although we have several very interesting questions, I'll, I'll raise this to a question. Um, uh, as Dr. Roth had mentioned, uh, that our data uh, is often, the ownership of data is currently owned by this major, uh, you know, uh, tech company in the world, five majors. And, uh, and previously, uh, this um, private uh, provider of data actually provided alternative uh, information uh, from the limited uh, information that is handed out by, by uh, the government because perhaps they don't have the capacity to, to collect and to gather um, a large number of data. But the question is, the ownership of this data is often debated. Uh, whether the ownership of data should belong to the providers of this, this uh, big tech companies or by the user, to what extent uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, pro private uh, data, uh, private tech industries uh, can be an alternative as Dr. Hario mentioned before, or maybe it becomes such a, you know, limitation of tyranny, uh, a, a bubble, uh, whether, or whether you can provide a, perhaps think of um, an alternative to that as a, you know, uh, as a mechanism of check and balance, for example, as an open source initiative. Um, and as this also resonate with Dr. Rod's mentioning of new modes of government, uh, empowering, you know, various actors to, to, you know, to play in the, in the 
you know, in, in the field. Uh, that's for Dr. Roth, uh, Dr. Hario and Dr. Roth. And additionally for uh, Dr. Roth, the question will be, as you mentioned, uh, Germany has really strict and robust uh, data privacy regulation and, and uh, to what extent that perhaps uh, Germany data government uh, might be transferable to Indonesia or Asia in general uh, that perhaps can help with this, uh, our you know, fighting with the pandemic or, um, you know, improving uh, the economy to bounce back and become resilient. Um, so, uh, maybe I provide the, the screen to Dr. Hayer and Dr. Phoenix. Uh, you are the one who's special. I, sorry, was it, uh, uh, you are the one who specialize in uh, data security. So you, I wish I can learn from you rather than you ask the question to me. Uh, to be honest, I'm not so, uh, I don't know so much about data security. Thank you. Uh, okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Hari, for your very honest uh, question. Uh, it's, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry for being unfair to raise the question whether we can provide alternative to this big five, um, you know, uh, tech industry that govern our life. Uh, but, you know, it's an issue that's ongoing that we perhaps can, um, you know, uh, ponder upon. Uh, I provide time to Dr. Roth to uh, provide his share of the opinion. Is yours, yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, again, very interesting and important question. I think, um, yes, Germany has a long tradition uh, based in its history of like misuse of data. I think it's really like a, a learning lesson that we've taken like uh, uh, through our times of, of dictatorship and, and uh, tyranny how uh, data in the wrong hands can within within uh, a short period of time can can do much evil and can be very harmful so and and i think that that's that's really like the origin of uh, of our data privacy policies which which i as a researcher and and also policymakers often find are kind of frustrating in daily lives because it often like as a researcher you need data you want all this uh, but uh we have to we have to somehow find a middle middle ground we have to find and and they are interesting and and the discussion of the of the covid 19 tracing apps uh show that if there's a political will and an and awareness of the risks, uh, it's possible to, to develop uh, technological solutions like the infrastructure for the COVID-19 app in, a, in this way, uh, sense, in a, in a, I think like a um, <clears throat> decentralized architect data architecture. And I think like um, without, I'm not like a software specialist myself, but from what all my colleagues tell me who are really into these technical aspects, they tell me like that uh, um, one of the, the, the really like positive uh, examples Germany has, has been able to offer is like the development of, of the COVID-19 app that probably wasn't the fan, isn't the fanciest ones uh, for them. And, 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 and it, it's limited in the amount of information that we can get out of it from users. But it's uh, in terms of data privacy, I think like uh, it really has demonstrated that it's possible to have a useful tool that at the same time respects data privacy things. And, 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 and what this really necessitates, this kind of technological developments, is that there's an awareness that we have to aware. And, and uh, I would really like see much more like on a, on a international level that like-minded countries and i think this uh i i don't uh i don't want to judge too much on on like indonesian affairs but I, uh, as all that i know is like that like-minded countries if uh, like democratic countries that are interested in the protection of uh the citizen rights and at the same same time want to use uh, new technologies 
that they uh, should like strengthen their collaborations and 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 create coalitions within international institutions, learn from each other and 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 be really open and uh, about like to see what's what's really adaptable and of course like Indonesian authorities have to decide on, on their own. It's, it's I think it's not it's not to anyone else like actually what solutions are appropriate to to deal with the local challenges because i think like all all uh, contexts are political and social and technological contexts are often so different that it's as i said before resilience can't be imposed top down it also can't be imposed from a global uh, organization or anything like it's it's something that uh, we we have to transfer and adapt Thank you, Dr. Roth. Thank you, Dr. Hari uh, Aswi Cahyono, uh, for your time and your comments. Uh, I know it's really a challenging and very broad topic to discuss the role of technology in handling the COVID pandemic. And, and we have, um, you know, every angle in the sun, under the sun that we can cover this topic from. But I know with all the best mind we see, uh, perhaps from the technological side, the, the importance of real-time uh, uh, high-frequency data and, and also how the government actually trying to adopt uh, technology. I know technology is working very fast. It's oh, every minute, so every day there's new technology coming in, but government are restrained by policies and as Dr. Rod mentioned, democ democratic process that they have to abide to. Uh, I thank you both um, and also Dr. Uh, Hamam Rija that left uh, us earlier for your insight on the matter. Thank you very much. Uh, and now uh, I would like to give the floor to um, the uh, head of organization that made this uh, dialogue, bilateral dialogue between Indonesia and Germany happen. Uh, Mr. Jan Sankir, President Representative of Conrad Adenauer System for Indonesia and Timor-Leste. Uh, I would like to give you the screen for five minutes uh, to share your comments of our three days discussion on the various topic uh, from the the international uh, framework to yesterday, the economic uh, perspective, and from today, uh, technological side on how uh, we can bridge this Indonesia and uh, Germany relationship uh, closer. Uh, Mr. Yatsen here, the screen is yours. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you, uh, Dr. Fitriani. Uh, first of all, I would like to welcome again, all participants of this video conference. I think that was a really very interesting uh, video conference. And I'm very happy that uh, we were able to continue our uh, Germany-Indonesia strategic dialogue together with CSIS this year. And uh, it seems to me that uh, the format of uh, digital video conference has proven to be effective and uh, uh, very useful. Although I hope uh, next year we may be able to go back to a physical meeting. But uh, to me, it is clear that the topic that we have chosen for this video conference is really one of the largest challenges uh, on a global level uh, at the moment. Uh, we have learned that uh, the uh, corona pandemic <clears throat> Uh, is uh, in a stage of a new increase after a certain flattening and, 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 and reducing of the infection curves in, uh, uh, in the summertime. Now we uh, <clears throat> experience a new increase of infections in many countries, uh, in Germany and also here in Indonesia. So we have to see how we can cope with that. Uh, the German ambassador on Monday has uh, mentioned that uh, Germany is uh, preparing for the winter time. Uh, well, uh, these uh, conditions for uh, the spread of the virus will be uh, uh, better in, in, the, in the sense that people 
will move into closed rooms and uh, be in a closer contact together. So uh, we have to see how we can mitigate and combat uh, this, um, uh, this pandemic. And I think during uh, the presentations and discussions uh, the last three days, we heard a lot of interesting um, uh, information and uh, uh, also uh, um, <clears throat> some lessons and uh, some um, advices what, what can be done. Uh, the impact of the pandemic uh, will be huge. We have talked about uh, the economic uh, impact. Uh, we still don't know yet how deep the crisis will go, but it will affect uh, all uh, countries on a global level. And uh, therefore it is important, uh, which what has also been uh, uh, stressed uh, by the two ambassadors on Monday, that we don't fall back into uh, isolationism, into uh, protectionism and nationalism. International cooperation is uh, crucial for handling the crisis. The virus doesn't know any, any boundaries, any borders and territorial restrictions. So only on a global level, we can uh, get this uh, uh, pandemic under control. Um, the discussion today have uh, uh, tackled uh, the importance of uh, tech new technologies. I think the, the main lessons that we learned from the pandemic is, and what will be the, the future effects is one, um, that, that certainly there will be a certain um, decline or, or slowdown of globalization. And therefore it is important that we don't fall back into uh, uh, um, uh, isolationism. And the other uh, lesson is that the importance of new technologies and especially digitalization, artificial intelligence, uh, but also other uh, technologies will, will rise. And here the role of uh, the stakeholders, of the politicians, of uh, the economy, of uh, the academic institutions, the research will be crucial. And I think that with this uh, conference, we could contribute a little bit. Uh, especially to the exchange of experience between Germany and Indonesia, two important big uh, influential countries in uh, their respective regions, Germany in uh, Europe and uh, Indonesia here in Southeast Asia. And uh, I think that uh, some of the uh, uh, results of this uh, conference can be taken up for further uh, cooperation and for the development. I would like to thank, first of all, the speakers um, of today. It was very interesting and uh, also the speakers of the previous days. And uh, of course, our partner CSIS, uh, Dr. Philip Svermonte, uh, Dr. Fitriani, and, and, and also um, Ibu Fifi for their excellent cooperation and uh, the support for uh, um, organizing this conference and I hope, as I said, next year maybe we can meet again either on the, on the, in, a, in a digital format or in a physical format. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, um, Sir Jan Sankir, uh, for very thoughtful uh, uh, closing remarks. I will give the floor to Dr. Philip Charmonte to give the floor. Yeah, thank you, uh, Fitri. And uh, I'd like to echo what uh, <clears throat> Jan Sankir uh, has already <clears throat> uh, stated that uh, it's been a very interesting three days uh, conference on the digital format that we tried this year uh, for the fourth uh, dialogue, uh, bilateral dialogue between Indonesia and Germany, uh, co organized by CSIS and uh, Konrad Adenauer Stiftung in Jakarta. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, Pak Jan Sankir and his team at the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung uh, for our productive uh, relation, relationship uh, in the past four years. And uh, I believe uh, we should continue uh, the discussions that would, uh, uh, through, through which uh, we can share uh, thoughts uh, on, on various issues. And, then, and this year, the big elephant in the room, of course, is the, the, the pandemic COVID-19. 
and uh, uh, to to sum up, I think uh, the presentation by Dr. Florian Roth uh, uh, earlier, kind of a uh, to me is the kind of a uh, summing up uh, the the purpose of all discussions about uh, COVID-19 from international cooperations, uh, economic <clears throat> cooperations, and uh, the technology uh, readiness that is to increase our resilience in dealing with uh, any type of global challenges that we are facing. Can be uh, climate change, can be another uh, or other pandemics uh, that are probably coming our way. We don't know when, but uh, I think uh, the discussions uh, or all the efforts, policy regulations and so on, needs to be geared towards increasing uh, our uh, uh, readiness and resilience in, in dealing with uh, the pandemic so that it would not cost much uh, in terms of uh, lives, uh, in terms of uh, you know human resources and so on already, the death caused by pandemics, of course, probably cost the best brains in so many countries, doctors, uh, healthcare providers, and so on and so forth. And we cannot, <clears throat> I think, uh, do the same mistakes that we did before the COVID-19 hit us. Uh, we <clears throat> uh, ignore the alerts uh, you know, provided by scientists, probably technologists as well, uh, who kind of, uh, uh, they are not really predicting, but they warn us about the probability of this kind of a catastrophic uh, a pandemic uh, was coming our way. So I think through this kind of dialogue, uh, we can uh, enhance uh, the probability of we becoming more uh, prepared for the next pandemic. And uh, also, I think from the last presentation by uh, Dr. Roth, uh, this is also very interesting. We are hoping that technology would help us uh, in the future, but uh, somehow Dr. Roth remind us that the societal factor, the society, the social factors, policymakers, if they are not aware, if, 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 if they are not <clears throat> uh, knowing you know, the, the limitation and the, the possibilities that technology can provide us, uh, it would mean nothing. So then uh, I think uh, this part of, of uh, the technology discussion uh, would be something that we need to dig in more uh, in the future because uh, otherwise uh, we cannot uh, outsmart you know, the, the, <laughs> the virus, uh, next viruses, uh, unless uh, we are doing it uh, smarter than, uh, than them you know, in terms of uh, we cooperate well and uh, we prepare our economy and so on. And uh, coming back to the first session, I think, uh, and uh, Dr. Jan Senkir mentioned, Dr. Roth, and uh, various speakers in the, in, the, in the past three days that international cooperation is really needed. And uh, multilateralism uh, also is uh, still needed. And uh, we need to convince uh, you know, both uh, people, in, in mostly probably in Indonesia, to convince them that uh, you know, multilateralism is not threatening our national interest, but it would actually help us achieving our national interest uh, by cooperating with other countries because the, the, the situation requires us to cooperate with other countries. So uh, with that, I, I'd like to once again, thank you all for the participant, the organizers, uh, Dr. Safia Muhibat and her team at CSIS. Thank you very much. And uh, we do have our knowledge management uh, team who you know uh, <clears throat> provide us with all these uh, facilities and then uh, make sure that everything runs smoothly technologically uh, uh, because this is a time uh, where CSI <laughs> ourselves uh, kind of uh, adapting to this new uh, situation that uh, all most of our interaction now happening through digital platform. Thank you, Fitri. Uh, back to you. Thank you for your closing remark, Dr. Philip Armonte, Executive Director of CSI Indonesia. Um, um, Mr. Jansen here, um, that represent Ponad Adenauer Stiftung and Dr. Philip Fermonte. We look forward for our um, institution uh, future collaboration, perhaps next year. And uh, until then, I wish you, uh, we all here, uh, the best of health and uh, you know sanity to get through all this pandemic and. Uh, 
looking forward for uh, furthering cooperation between our two countries. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you thank Dr. Wat. Mas Aryo, thank you. Terima kasih. Everyone, PP. Thank you, thank you everyone. All right. Bye. Bye.